Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me this week. And today we're going to be looking at God's prescription for marriage. We're going to first start out looking at what is the marriage covenant. And today I have a word for every single person, husband, wife, single person. God has a word for you today and I'm going to give it to you. So come back. As we look around today, we see that there's the divorce rate is so high. And this morning, I'm going to start a series on teaching God's will and God's word concerning the marriage covenant and how you husbands as well as wives can increase uh, your marriage because increase your marriage for the better. Marriage is supposed to be a taste of heaven on earth. And if you don't have that, then I've got the word for you today. Now, first and foremost, we have to understand that the concept of marriage, it is not societies. The idea of marriage, it did not come from any government. It didn't come from any society. It came from God. As a matter of fact, when we look in the word of God, we see that that was one of the first things that God established after he created the heavens and the earth and Adam and Eve. Marriage came into being. But today, one of the problems we have in this world is a lack of the fear of God. So what happens is we have people that get together, um, they shack up, they hook up, they do all sorts of ups, except going through God's way. And if you don't do it God's way, then you'll never ever experience what it's like to have a taste of heaven on earth. And so this morning, we're going to first start with looking at the marriage covenant. What does the marriage covenant entail? Well, first and foremost, we have to understand that the marriage covenant is number one, a legal relationship established by God. And we have scriptures for that. The first scripture we have is Malachi chapter two, verse 14, where the Lord says, yet you ask for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have acted treacherously against her, though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. So we see in that scripture that number one, it's a legal relationship and it's established by God. And then number two, the word of God tells us in Matthew chapter 19, verse six, it says, and this is God talking. He says, Jesus says, there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Now, I know many of you out there are asking me, does God put all of these marriages together? Well, we'll get to that later, but I'll give you a little hint. No. No. <laughs> now, the second thing, so number one, the marriage covenant, it's a legal relationship that God has established. The second thing, the marriage covenant functions under God's authority. Be and understand this, that God is the ultimate authority in marriage. And the world has to submit to that. The world must come under submission to this truth. God's it was God's idea. Marriage is God's plan. Marriage is God's idea. It marriage did not come from society. Marriage did not come from any religion. Man, marriage did not come from any group of people or a person. Marriage came from God himself. And it was so from the beginning. And that's important because as I continue to teach along uh, God's prescription for marriage, you're going to see and you're going to understand something. Um, and I'll mention the word is original intent. That'll give you an idea in terms of God's direction and plan for where marriage is supposed to go, how it's supposed to go to get to the destination that he intended marriage to take a couple. So number two, the marriage covenant functions under God's authority, who is the ultimate authority in marriage, and society has to submit itself to that. We have in the word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. It says, but I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. So you see there again that God 
is the head. He's the ultimate authority when it comes to marriage. Number three, when you break a divine covenant, it causes death. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, and you might be saying, yeah, but um, I'm divorced and I'm not dead. No, you're not dead, but you're living under the curse. There's a curse that goes along with, 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 with divorce. And we'll talk about that some more. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. So what we see happening is God already prescribed, gave him the prescription, Don't eat from this tree. Everything else is yours. Just do not eat. Eat, eat this tree. If you do, what happens? You die. So what happened? Adam ate, he broke the covenant, and what happened is he died. Did he die immediately, physically? No. But he died in terms of his relationship with God, because if you continue to read the word, you'll see where God put swords in the Garden of Eden by the entrance that stopped Adam from getting in to be able to eat from the tree of life, which was his source and his connection to God. And so what happens when you break covenant is you inflict a curse on yourself, which ultimately leads to death. Now, let's keep going. The difference between a contract and a covenant, and this is so important for you to understand, the difference is a covenant is based on relationship, whereas a contract is not. It's not necessary for a personal relationship to exist between parties in a contract. However, in covenant, there's a relationship that is established, and that's the primary difference between a contract, and a covenant. Now, let's keep going. Let's look. Now, having said all that, God is the originator. God is the one that established the marriage covenant. Let's look and let's see what God's intention is in terms of functions for between the husband and the, the, the wife. Because what we have to understand is that there are different roles and there are different functions in the home. And a lack of understanding, what that does is it causes problems in the home. Now, people might say, well, especially you'd hear young people, well, we love each other, love will take care of it. Well, let me tell you this. If <laughs> there's so many divorces that, took, that are taking place and have taken place because the mentality of the people that got involved was that love would take care of it. We have got to, single people, you have to prepare yourself for marriage because marriage is a commitment. You have to prepare yourself for the commitment of marriage. If you don't, what happens is this opens up the door and it will lead to a failed marriage. So it's important to understand the function or the roles or the task that the responsibilities that's assigned, not by man, but by God. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the responsibilities that God has assigned to the man and to the woman in the covenant relationship. Now, why would God do that? Well, because marriage, a marriage that's functioning in the way that God has prescribed it to, has prescribed it to function, it will advance the kingdom of God. That's why. And God is interested in the advancement of his kingdom because when his kingdom is advanced, people's lives are changed. So I'm not talking about the roles and the responsibilities that society would try to give to a man and a wife in a marriage. As a matter of fact, what we see happening today is society is trying to redefine marriage. Society is trying to define marriage. And society can never define marriage because marriage isn't society's idea. Marriage is God's idea. Marriage is God's plan. So I'm not talking about the, 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 the responsibilities and the tasks that, that, that society would try and put on a man or a woman. I'm talking about what God says. 
uh, and the, the responsibilities that God has assigned to the man and the woman in the relationship. So let's look at the functions first of the man in the home. The first thing, the word of God tells us that the man is supposed to love his wife and his family. Our scriptures are Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 28. Listen to what it says. It says, husbands, love your wives just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So the word of God makes it very clear that the husband is supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And what does that mean? That means men that you will, you, you are willing to give yourself, give your life for your wife, because it says just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Jesus gave his life for the church. Men, you're supposed to love, love your wives in the same way. Number two, men, your function as God has prescribed it in the home is that you are the priest. You are the spiritual leader in the home. It shouldn't be where your wife has to keep saying, come, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. It should be you Mr. You, sir, taking responsibility and being the head in leading your home into the presence of God. Okay. And we have scriptures for that. First Corinthians chapter three, chapter 11, verse three and four. Here again, it talks about the relationship. It says that Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of the woman. And God is the head of Christ. And here again, I'm not talking about what society says. I'm talking about what God says. Men, God says that you're supposed to be the spiritual leader of your house. And you might say, yeah, but my wife can pray so much better than me. Listen, it doesn't matter how eloquent you are in your words. As a matter of fact, Jesus prescribed that to the Pharisees. They had the most eloquent words and they stood out where everyone could hear them. And what did God call them? They were hypocrites. It has nothing to do with how eloquent you are, how good you can speak, how well you can tense your verses, how well you can put a, a verb with a noun. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with your heart and you being the priest, the head of your home. You are responsible for going and taking your family into God's presence every day. You are responsible for communicating to your father for your family and about your family. So that's really important. Next thing, husbands, you're supposed to provide for your home. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Now if anyone does not provide for his own relatives and especially for his household. He has denied the faith and he's worse. He's worse than an unbeliever. Men, you're supposed to provide for your home. That is so important. If you want your wife to respect you and to honor you, you need to provide for your home. And you might say, yeah, but my wife makes more than me. We're going to get into that as well. We're going to talk about that as well. Okay. But I need to move on because I have a lot I want to cover this morning. So you're supposed to provide for your home as stated in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Next, men, you are responsible to cultivate and to develop the purpose of God for each member of your family and lead them to their destiny. How do you do that? You have to lead the way. You have to know your purpose. You have to know your purpose in God. You, know, have, you have to know your destiny. Once you know your destiny, once you know your purpose, then they'll be able to follow you and it'll be easier for you to be able to cultivate their purpose, cultivate and to help develop their purpose, God's purpose for their lives as well as their destinies. 
So you have to know, okay, you have to understand and you have to know why am I here? Why am I here as the head of this home over, these, the, over this wife and these children? What's my purpose? What is God's purpose for me being here on this planet? Why am I consuming oxygen? Why am I taking up space on this planet? Men, you have to know that first before you can ever cultivate and develop that in your children and in your family. That's important. You're called to do that. You are anointed. You are appointed to do that. Not your wife. You are. And then the next thing is men, you're supposed to leave a financial and a spiritual inheritance to your children. You're supposed to leave a spiritual inheritance and a financial inheritance to your children. One of the things that I have seen over the years is I speak to, you know, in knowing God has blessed me in that uh, I'm, I'm, I uh, have relationships with some of um, the, the leaders of the church today, the apostles and the prophets. And I'm talking about those who operate truly as apostles, who's, who've had divine visitations by God, those who have the supernatural power of God working in their lives every day, those who have miracles taking place in their lives and they're giving it to people, they're distributing miracles to people. I've been blessed to, to have relationships and to know some of these leaders in the church of God. And one of the things that I've, I, I ask and I, I learn about their backgrounds, where you came from, who are your parents? And what I find is the people, who, the, the ministers who God is uh, using in this day and age as leaders in the church, who grew up in the church, I, what I notice is that well, they grew up in the church. God has, they have a rich spiritual heritage. Their grandfather, their great grandfather, their father, they were ministers to God. They were called by God. And now you have this third and fourth generation that's doing the same thing. That produces power. That produces power in that third and fourth generation. And that's why it's so important that you, you, you train and you teach and you lead and you guide your children into their purpose and their destiny, as well as you, you give them a spiritual inheritance. That is so important. Give them something that they can hold on to. Listen, everything around us is shaking. Even the ground is shaking. And the Bible tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But when you have an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance, you're not shaken. And for those of you, you are the first in your generation that you know of, that know and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You are now starting to create an inheritance for your children. So hang in there and keep God and his kingdom first. And you will create uh, an inheritance for your generations, uh, for the generations after you. Now it also says, God also says, and his, he's prescribed, it's his will that you fathers, you leave a financial inheritance to your children. That is so important as well. Because you see, you want your children to, to not have to start where you are, but you want your children to be able to move forward because you've left them a base. You've left them a strong foundation. You've left them an in, a, a, a physical inheritance. And I'll tell you this too. I am very much so blessed because my father grew up in, in the church. So I had that spiritual inheritance. I knew Jesus as a young child. And not only that, but my father, he also left us a, a physical inheritance. And I have to say, based on, on, on looking at these things, I had a good father. I had a very good father, but could not compare and can never compare to my heavenly father. So it's important because you want your children to do more and to be ahead. Move much further ahead in life than you did. So you have to leave them a spirit. And the two of them work together. You have to understand that they work together. You leave your children, you give your children a spiritual inheritance. Even if you might not have been able to leave them much physically, that spiritual inheritance, if they walk in it, it will produce and it will increase the physical inheritance that you've left them. And if you might not have even had anything to leave, 
The fact of the matter is you've, if you've left them a spiritual inheritance, if you've given them spiritual things and you teach them the importance of spiritual things, the spiritual inheritance that you gave them, that's going to create and produce a physical inheritance for your children. So it's really important. And you know, this is so interesting because in the Jewish culture, poverty is viewed as a sin. And so it's, it, it, and you know why? Because they find that in, in the Torah. We find in the book of Deuteronomy, one of the curses is poverty. One of the curses is lack. And so, and the powerful thing is that when you have a spiritual inheritance, that can translate and it will translate into a physical inheritance. So men, you have it laid out for you. You don't have time to, to be all over the place with all so many different women. You have time to create a spiritual and a physical inheritance for your children, to be blessed, to leave your name in the earth. That's what it's about, to be a blessing in the earth and to leave your name in a powerful way in the earth. And so I'm encouraging you to take your rightful place and position. If you do what God says to do, if you line up with God's order of things, you are going to receive the benefits and the blessings in God's pattern of order. And whenever you're flowing in God's order, there's prosperity. Whenever you're out of order, that's where cursings are. So come into God's order. Be the man and the father God has called you to. And if you, you might say, well, it's too late. Listen, it's never too late. The first thing you have to do is you have to repent. Turn around. Ask God to forgive you. And once you do that and allow his life to come into you, then you're on the path for creating a spiritual and a physical inheritance for your children. Now, Let's move on to the function of the woman in the home. Okay. Wives, women, what are you called to do? First and foremost, women, you're supposed to be your husband's ideal helper. We find that in Genesis chapter two, verse 18. And I'm going to read that to you. The Bible says in Genesis two eighteen, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is like him. He made Eve like Adam so she'd be able to help Adam. He made Eve like Adam so Eve would know Adam and know his needs and to help in help nurturing and taking care of those needs. So let's keep going. The word helper in Hebrew is E-Z-E-R, and it means to enclose, to surround, to protect, to help, and rescue. Now, men, I know that you think that your wife talks too much and she's a nag, but I want you to understand the, the, the power of your wife. Your wife is called to surround you. She's called to protect you. She's called to help you and to rescue you. Listen, men, you don't see everything. Contrary to how you feel and think, sometimes you're wrong and sometimes you just don't see the, no, not sometimes, you never see the whole picture. The only person that sees, sees the whole picture is God. And God, my husbands, God has given you a helpmate to help you see the whole picture. So it's important that you, you receive this gift because your wife is a gift from God to surround you, to protect you, to help you, to rescue you, to be a blessing to you, to be an encourager to you. It's important that you accept this gift that God has given you. Now, women, how, how do I function as my husband's protector? How do I rescue him? This is one way you do it. Not by trying to counsel him. I told you, if you had done this, you see you're in this situation because of this. No, 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 no. A hundred times, no, a thousand times, no women. That's not the way. How do you protect? How do you surround? How do you rescue? How? Through prayer and intercession. The power of prayer and intercession. That's the most powerful thing that you can do for your husband. To pray, to surround him, to cover him with your prayers. Now wives, 
You're supposed to respect your husbands. The word of God tells us in Ephesians 5.33, it says, To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Women, you're supposed to respect your husband. Next, you're supposed to admire your husband. You're supposed to have a high opinion of him. You're supposed to be his cheerleader. You're supposed to be his greatest cheerleader. If you don't take that place of being his greatest cheerleader, there'll be another woman there who will do it. So women, wives, you have to take your rightful place and your position. You are an encourager, not a nagger. Number three, you must submit to your husband. And you might be asking me, do I submit to him in everything? Well, we're going to get to that as well. For right now, just listen. You must submit to your husband. What I want you to see is the relationship he has with God determines your submission. If he has a relationship with God, if he is walking with God, if he is taking his rightful place and position in the home, you must submit to him. There'll be no need for you to fight against him. There'll be no need for you to be rebellious. You have to submit to him as long as he is walking with God, as long as he still holds the word of God as first and foremost in his life. You must submit to him. And then... You must fulfill your sexual responsibilities to your husband. That is very important. You can't have a headache every night. You can't have back pain. You can't be exhausted every night. You have to fulfill your sexual responsibilities to your husband. And when you do that, you have a very happy man on your hands. Okay? And you know, it's easier to live with a happy man than a miserable man. So... When men, when you do what God says to do, when you become the priest, when you provide for your home, when you provide and lead your family in the direction of fulfilling God's plan and purpose, when you leave a spiritual and physical, you're planning and you're working this out in your marriage relationship, you're doing this for your family. When you do that, I'll tell you this, you have no problems with your wife submitting to you. When you say, honey, come, let's pray, you have no problems with, for, for your wife to submit to you. And I'm telling you, because my husband and I, we've been married 23 years, and my husband says, let's pray. We never leave the house unless we pray. Even when he's not at home, we call and we talk and we communicate, and we always, always talk to our Heavenly Father, and He always takes us there. And so it's so important. My husband is a happy man because he does what the word says to do. And in turn, I can do what the word says to do. I respect him. I'm his greatest cheerleader. I, pro, I, I do the things that I need to do. I fulfill my sexual responsibilities to my husband. I submit to him. Listen, you do it and you're gonna have a happy husband. Men, you do your role and you're gonna have a happy wife. And that's how you start to taste heaven on earth. Now come back next week. I'm going to answer some of the questions, the million dollar questions that you have. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Listen, if everything, if anything, pray together today. Go to your father. Men, call your wives. Call your wife and say, come, let's pray. Start your day right. And God will be with you through the whole day, blessing you and giving you his peace and joy. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.